Welcome back to Think Tech. It's one one o'clock, uh, one o'clock rock here on a given Monday, and that means it's time for research in Mano, one of our favorite shows, um, and uh, that's that's provided to us by HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysical Planetology, which is part of the School of Ocean Earth Science at UH Manoa. And we have two special people from uh, HIGP. We have Professor Jeff Taylor uh, from HIGP and Linda Martell. She's a researcher there. And we're going to talk today about science stories. I'm not sure exactly what that means or how this is going to hang together, but I think it's important that we cover stories because stories have, you know, the idea of, of, of history. History. So let's talk first about history. Welcome to the show, Linda. Welcome, Jeff. Hi, Jake. <laughs> Good to be here, Jay. We're celebrating this month 20 years of writing science stories wow. for NASA. That is a long for, time. Yeah. On our website, Planetary Science Research Discoveries, and it's Planetary it's Science Research, Research Discoveries. Discoveries. Dot Oh, it's PSRD. PSRD. Dot Hawaii. Dot edu. Dot Hawaii. Dot edu. Okay. And it's it started out. Uh, um, we we have been doing education things together, but we both like the communication of these ideas and telling the science stories. And it's important and for it's the a public way, to it's, know these stories. Yeah, and it's one of the ways we can, one of the questions people will always ask is, well, what, what good is this? Well, our job is to say what good it is and also just to say, here's a greater world around us. We aren't just, just Honolulu, or just Oahu, just the Hawaiian Islands, or even just the Earth. It's a much bigger thing thing we occupy. You know, there's a risk of living on an island where you sort of fold in on a, a small world and not see the outside. It reminds me of The King and I, where, you remember there's a, there's a scene in The King and I where Yul Brenner has a map of the world and the whole world is Siam. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you fold in on yourself, but you need to look outside. We need to look outside. It's important to see the whole. There's also another map, as long as you mention map, the New Yorker's map of the United States, where where the Mississippi is, is actually the Hudson. And it's all <laughs> we have that in my office. Uh, you know exactly the one you mean. There's two of them. One looks east from California. One looks west from New York, and it, it makes everything in between small. I know, know? <laughs> and but they aren't small, and the whole thing needs to come together. And I think that's it's true of telling the, the, the getting the public to learn those that concept that this is a big big world, a big universe, interrelated world and universe. And that's true, we have to teach students that. Mm -hmm. And and to look at things in, in different angles, different viewpoints, different data sets even, you know? Some, you can look at the United States and think of it in terms of its population, diversity of the population, its, its education level, or you can even look bigger, that there's diseases to solve, there's uh, exploration to do. You know, it's, there's all different the levels that we can look kind. at things. Yeah. And this takes you away from the base instincts that take you into more negative things like war and terrorism and all that. It's better to look big. It's better to see the challenges of, of humanity. Earth as a whole planet. Yeah, yeah. We as inhabitants taking care of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right, sure. Yeah, taking care of it. And Environmental, you look, climate you look change, at the earth from afar, you really think, boy, the people living there really should be taking care of each other instead of fighting with each other. And, and so the perspective planetary science gives us and astronomy too yeah. is, is very important. Yeah, so, it is. It's, it's a message to everyone. Think big, you know, and um, take care of each other. <laughs> yeah. So when we started to PSRD, we wanted to be an, a, a source for people that they would know that the science is correct, like we're reporting uh, good science, uh, to be that kind of, mm -hmm. you know. Y yeah, yeah. So what's, what's on there? Articles? Um, we have many features. We take, we, um, we find a story that has just come out in a scientific journal mm -hmm. that, that frankly moves us, mm. one of us at least is going to write it, to think it's this, is, when it's, when it's this is when it's unanimous, that is really something. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hard to get a consensus. <laughs> <laughs> but we, uh, once you uh, get an article and you want to explain it, you got to read it, 
understand it yourself. Now, we are scientists, so that, that's not so hard to do, but some of these things are really are tricky. So, and then you have to explain it. And, and so we, I like to say we translate it into English from the original geek. And, and it's, it's, a, it's fun to do, to try to get it to, to explain things. And people, uh, the public, we have gotten good response from the public. We've gotten great response from uh, college students who use them as the basis, beginning at least of a term paper. You can um, read our summary and then go to the Science Journal. Sure, you give them both. Yeah. It gives you a link to the you Science to, Journal. To so the you science can and a glossary. Although we try not to use scientific jargon, sometimes you can't help it. So at least we have a glossary, so you, you can learn you that. Know, yeah, learn you can't help it. You know, sometimes about, glo about jargon, and it happens in the legal profession, too. Oh, you know, sure. you, you use a word, and you do not know anymore that is jargon. <laughs> yeah. You forgot already. You forgot that that <laughs> word is actually a technical word, and because you use it so much, it's kind of interesting. So if I find a, a stiff acronym in there somewhere, a glossary will <laughs> it help should me. Help you. <laughs> yeah. Should should yeah. lead the way yeah. to to its definition. So how often you know do you write? You know, this sounds like a lot of work to me because there's a lot of articles come out, mm. and um, and it's not easy to interpret some of them or you know mm -hmm. make them understandable to the public. How often do you do that? We try to do one a month. Mm -hmm. One big article, and we have short features too, that just give the highlight of an article and give a reference to the article. And that's kind of a way just leading, just to give more, we can do more diverse topics that way too. And they are easier to write, mm -hmm. quicker to write than the longer articles are. Sometimes we know when an article will, will come out like next week and we'll have something ready so that when the embargo is lifted then we can go oh, cool. right, right so to it. So you get an advanced copy, mm -hmm. embargo, and then you're yeah. ready to spring. Yeah, so are you getting better at it? <laughs> That's an interesting, uh, <laughs> you know, it's an interesting question. Is the getting better or quicker? <laughs> I'd say yes to both, yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. So I think we, yeah, I think we are. Our yeah. first story was this huge announcement in 1996 96. about potential uh, evidence for past life on Mars. So it caught everyone's attention. Great. Do you remember this? It was really did hit. It was uh, even the president, which was uh, Bill Clinton at the time, got involved and made a statement about this. And it was a big press conference. And we have a picture, actually, the number one, two, number two picture is this uh, press conference the oh, there the reporter, it is. a NASA photo, I think. That, that yeah. rock in the box is a Martian meteorite that had uh, the pieces in it that they said some were... Organic material of some kind. Possibly. There was some organic material. <laughs> De there definitely was organic material in it. There were things that looked like fossils. Two of the chief discoverers are the ones, their back were mostly to us there. Uh, uh, ones uh, kind of in the middle, Dave McKay and Everett Gibson, and they... Uh, there were some prime movers on it. And Dave told me, Dave McKay, who, by the way, was on my PhD dissertation oh, committee when I was at well. Rice. Yeah. And he knows you well. <laughs> yeah, he said that this whole thing was and just a zoo. He had never experienced anything like this before because From everyone press, was yeah. so excited about it, all the press. You can see them gathered there. And, the, and it's, uh, it, it was quite interesting. So they found multiple lines of evidence that if you interpret it them all one way. You could say, oh, maybe these were fossils. But that was only one way to interpret all the data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was and the other way? That it was not formed by, the, oh. it, was it was just a, a regular It was a terrific process. debate about it. Uh, some things like uh, the picture number four shows a little thing that looks for all the world like a fossil. Uh, no, right, really. Right there there like a little worm four. there looks like a bacteria. It it's, however, ten times shorter in length. And one argument was, well, you can't have, there's not enough room for all the DNA or even its RNA to fit in it. That was a big debate. Another was, well, actually, that's an artifact of sample preparation. <laughs> and one of the people <laughs> who uh, said that is, now on our faculty, uh, a guy named John Bradley, and he uh, who does uh, electron microscopy and really well, he, he he said that, you know, it's it's an artifact.
fact of coating these things with gold and looking at them, they had an electron microscope. When it's a microscope that was better, artifact is all. Yeah. It's, was, was, it was better than any used previously on looking at this kind of objects, and they, they may have picked up an artifact. Now, it was disputed, and it's hard to prove, but it is saying here's another alternative. Another one was one of the lines of evidence where they had tiny magnetite, that's the iron oxide grains, which make magnets, you know, lodestone. Yeah. And they were only 10 micrometer, uh, 10, 10 nanometers in size. And they- That's like less than a human hair? Yeah, way less. And um, they were pure iron and oxygen. There was no impurities in it. And they said, that's a hallmark of magnetite made by bacteria on the earth. And, and several, t many types of bacteria make it. Uh, presumably it has to do with navigation, you know, which way is up or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. I've never, I've never asked a bacteria <laughs> in person. No, no, but, no, but uh, if they know it, that, that's better than some people I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 and, uh, well, and it turns out other mechanisms can make these, and one of the great things is that they have to be really pure magnets and the way to do that has nothing but iron in it, no other elements except for oxygen, of course. But, and well, um, other people started making these pure things by taking solutions and evaporating it and you get pure magnetite. Others took a carbonate that had iron, iron carbonate and shocked it and heated it and by high pressure shock like a meteorite impact would do and out drops little magnetites. So, so you and by can't the way, be what sure it? that it's bacteria at all. No. <laughs> and, and here's a really fun fact. Fun fact. <laughs> a lot of it. Ready for a fun fact? Okay. <laughs> fun facts are great. <laughs> so Dave McKay, he's, he's the leader of this group who looked at this meteorite and one of the people opposed, really opposing the idea or testing it thoroughly, including the idea that magnetites can form by solution chemistry without the role of bacteria, Gordon McKay, Dave's brother. <laughs> I wonder what they talk about when they get Thanksgiving together. up Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> <You're> really? <exactly. laughs> then another HIGP researcher, Ed Scott, also um, found other ways for things in this rock to form. It's Besides, uh, but it all biological. sounds good for the process, though. Oh, it, you're, you know, you're faced with a, what could be a phenomenal discovery, mm -hmm. and now you have to think of alternatives. Oh yeah, and it also sparked, I think, astrobiology yes. as as a whole field. As a, yeah. Really, uh, yeah. you know, people are interested in it, but this gave them something much more concrete and uh, yeah. something to build around. And it also showed, considering the debate about this, these observations, which. They were good observations. They were also aware of things like contamination. They mm -hmm. tested for it themselves, the original team. Well, they, it was, um, it just it shows that you have to test things thoroughly and how hard it is to test it. We have the rock. I mean, really, how hard is it? But you know, there's a worry about contamination in the data, earth. Data, the tools, the thought process, the, the yeah. logic and, and external phenomenon that might bear on it in some parallel way. I mean, it's enough to give you a headache. And, <laughs> and when we come back from this break, Jeff and Linda, I'm going to ask you whether there are any undisputed signs of um, what life uh, anywhere other than Earth. Who? Don't answer that yet. We're going to come back and okay, see we'll, what you do we'll with think that of the question. answer. I'll Google. I'll <laughs> Google. Okay, quick, quick. Ah, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon, thinktechhawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful, way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for a likable science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, offering lifelong learning from passionate hosts and fascinating guests ready to explore and explain Hawaii's place in the 21st century. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Bingo, we're back. 
the one o'clock rock research in manoa with jeff taylor and linda martell a regular visitor is here on research in manoa thank you guys so we'll be talking about during during the break about education can we talk about that for a minute yeah i was um harping <laughs> on that i think we need to teach more some people need to appreciate the science is equal in importance including its historical aspects to to all the humanities and which are are important both literature uh history um the anthropology the study of the human condition sociology you see what we're doing now all these things are important all can be quantified to some degree some is pure art and that's that is has its own sense you know in fact art for its own sake is not much different than fundamental science for its own sake. But we need, I don't think we're giving enough of the science part because I think people perceive it to be too hard when in fact it doesn't have to be, which is why we have our webpage, yeah. to try to say, well, this isn't that hard, even though you have this, the wackiest title imaginable. <laughs> Very creative people can go into the arts isn't and can go true? into science. I think they blend. And not only does the PSRD website tell stories about science, but <laughs> there's a whole other way to get science into people's minds, and that's through books. <laughs> you could, for example. I, oh, a book. Look, oh, look, a book. I happen to have a book, book here. Yeah. This book. See if we can get a shot right of the here. book. There in fact, go. we have there's a, the actually, cover. Like, there's the cover. <laughs> in its new incarnation as a Kindle product, available from Amazon. Feel free to buy it. A novel, worth Impact. The it's a novel by so Odor and it's Impact. 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 It's and by. What, is it, uh, what does it deal with? It looks like J.G. Taylor. That's me, J.G. Taylor. That's, that's me. You. Yeah. And my friend Ron Fodor. We wrote this in the late 70s, published in 1978 or 9. Still relevant. And it's still relevant. It's a threat of a big impact. And we came up with the idea because we were both like to write. He had just written a book about uh, j um, meteorites, it was a meteorite book for children. Stones from the sky, <laughs> and he, we were talking, you know, and it was he was making a little money on it, but he was, we were saying, well, if you really want to make a lot of money, you want a meteorite book with sex and violence. So <laughs> that 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 strains the imagination. <laughs> you know, the sex life of a meteorite. <laughs> well, but you do have people involved in the meteorites, and they're prone to uh, both of those activities. Something about the the quality of that science, hey. And uh, so we included that in telling the story about the, th the problems with the threat of a media so big meteorite impact. on Amazon right it's now? It's on Amazon. Just and I can download it on Kindle? You can download it on Kindle. That's what, that's what kids like me do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, it's, it's fun to write it. And it's, it's, um, we bring this up to plug the book. Let's face that fact. But the excuse is <laughs> that actually it is another way of telling science stories. You know, you can tell... Because this is this was classified as science fiction, but you know it isn't. It is a story about a scientific, real threat, and so you get science background about this and how do the characters try to save the world from it all. Oh. And you could do the same with uh, science in a moon base, where you would teach true, accurate lunar science as we know it now, yep. in the, in the context of a fictional story. Yep. And I think that that is a whole nother a way, way of science. doing it. You know, our webpage does it through nonfiction. Uh, we know, we explain an article. But this fiction idea is that, and you may, you just reach people differently. And di maybe different people, or maybe yeah. the same people, just differently. Is, it, is there a reference on your website to the book? There should be. There is. Uh, we, we do have some little... Oh, we made a little report about it, yeah. Okay, good, <laughs> good. Report, but we, So yeah, it's we, impact exclamation point. Fodor and Taylor, and you can get it on Amazon. Watch your sales skyrocket, <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting, you know, it's an old book. It's uh, some things, the real technology being used is a bit out of date. So rather than change it all, because, you know, it's, it was easier to simply make a Kindle edition with small edits sure, of sure, things that sure. we, we didn't like the way we had written them. Oh, so the edition with the changes is the Kindle edition. Kindle with small cool, changes, cool. but not updated. So it is set back at that time. So it has kind of outdated technology. But the meteorite side and the impact science is, cool. is still good. So um, you may think that I forgot the question I posed just before the break, <laughs> but I didn't. So is there, 
really any hard indication that there has been life in this solar system or anywhere outside of Earth? Do we have organic material? Do we have fossils that we believe? Um, how, how, and how do you feel about the, the level of, of science, a level of discovery on this question? Mm, so, no fossils. <laughs> but there's, there's chemical elements, and there's things like this on comets and asteroids, and there's... Um, but nothing has been shown to be made by something biological. Yeah. It's all sort of the building blocks of what life could become. Uh -huh. It came to Earth on rocks <laughs> or in the water, yeah. and then somehow life began. But as far as I know, there's no um, evidence. The best evidence anywhere. was this Martian meteorite, and it just didn't, uh, it didn't hold up to scrutiny. Uh, so th uh, at the end of the day, the scientific community was not generally convinced. No. The original no, authors no. still were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so what are we looking for? If we were looking, you know, what, what would convince you? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know, because, you know, there's debate, and I don't know the status now, but 20 years ago when we wrote this article, there was a lot of debate about the oldest fossils on the Earth. How old were they? Because you had a rock, and you knew it was old and some, some almost four billion years. And they had fossils in them, but you know, they had to come up with rules to say those fossils were in the rock when it formed and were not added a billion years yeah, later. Yeah. And, and even that then is a hard job. And this, are, this, this is a contaminated planet. I mean, there's life everywhere. I mean, you die, every, every single drop of water that's cooler than than 110 Celsius, a little bit above boiling. That's something living in that's, it. That's the magic. You know? That's the magic, yeah. isn't it? Our Everywhere. contamination is our strength. Yeah. But some, yeah. something you said a minute ago is that, that we do know that there are things which are the building blocks are present in, you know, in stellar, stellar connection. Amino acids. Amino acids. <laughs> it's a building block. So it's sort of seductive to think, well, if the building blocks are there, we know that for a fact, no, no argument about that, then the possibility clearly exists that these things either have or are or will someday be, be generating life. Yeah. Yeah. Although the Earth is so unique because they call it the Goldilocks, you know, we're a Goldilocks planet. Not too far away from the sun, not too close to yeah, the sun, yeah, just yeah. perfect for our it's life. It's all perfect. I'm so glad we live here. <laughs> I, I, I would not be as, ha as, as happy any, any, any other planet, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we got more pictures? Oh, or, or uh, well, do you want to move on? We have to another story. Another story, there's then. That rock. There's that a, meteorite. The other story in the last 20 years, this, that's the Martian meteorite that's up on the screen now. But number five, we've shown this uh, another visit to Think Tech. That's a, this is a graduate student of ours now out uh, in the world in England. Uh, she worked on water in moon rocks. And w after Apollo came back, we looked at the rocks. They were really, w did seem to be bone dry, and there was all kinds of perfectly sound arguments, but the technology was not up to the task of saying how bone dry. Mm -hmm. And in 2008, some people who were completely naive to this idea <laughs> of no water on the moon uh, measured it unambiguously no contamination issues in uh, volcanic glasses. And so uh, there's been a lot of study done since then, including some by us here because of uh, that graduate student, Katie Robinson, and others by, um, by postdoctoral fellows we've had, people in other labs. It's really been a big deal. And then not only is the water in the moon, when it, and which is important for the, how the moon how do you, too. How can you tell this water in the moon? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's bone dry, but there are signs that convince you scientifically that there has been yeah, water on uh, the moon. Yeah, there's minerals that contain... Uh, so what are those uh, minerals? One is apatite, the same thing our teeth are made of. <laughs> okay. And, um, and then there are... You say apatite like a meal? Uh, uh, you use your teeth for a meal, so I, okay. I think the appetite, There's a relationship. I think, I, the name, I, I think the name is some Greek name. Uh, anyway. Is that on the periodic table? Appetite is, is a phosphate mineral. It's a fertilizer. Okay. And <laughs> All right. You heard it here on Think Tank. Yeah. <laughs> fertilizer on my mind because we've been working on a proposal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
Um, so that, that demonstrates to your scientific satisfaction that there has been water on There's the moon. water in the chemical formula of these minerals. But it's not water I could put in my hand and feel wet. It's not water no. that's H two O in a dissolved classic sense. In, it was dissolved in magmas and end up in minerals. Many years ago. Yeah, yeah, it was early on when the basalts on the moon formed. Over three billion years ago, but they were in the moon when it formed. Okay, is there a, an alternative logical solution for the presence of this stuff? No, not that stuff. But there's other water on the moon. Mm. Oh, there's water in the okay. poles. And there are areas in the poles, at the lunar poles, because the moon is, because it's, its orbit's tilted a bit compared to the Earth's orbit. And anyway, it, it stays straight up and down, and the sun's rays at the bottom and the top, north and south. Uh, and with craters making topography, there are areas that are in permanent shadow. That, it's more stable sun, then. It's, it's rotation. It's more, more stable it's, than. Yeah. And so, it's a, they say we, we like instability. The Earth <laughs> is a relatively in, unstable place, there right? There you go. From the well, <laughs> to a certain extent, but actually, the presence of the moon has presented, uh, prevented the Earth from wobbling too much over time, yeah. over million year cycles, yeah. which makes a steadier climate. Yeah. So, so you don't have big climate swings, which some people have argued. You don't have any climate. You don't it's have any climate, same, climate but you do have permanent shadow regions that are are I cold. Think. They're they're twenty five degrees it's Kelvin. Always cold. I mean, they really are cold. And the water, if yeah. say you add some by an impact, a comet impact, it a lot of it gets lost because it's it's flying around. It gets dissociated too by, but then it might go to the polar regions get trapped and it has been measured there by spacecraft. Tra trapped by the cold. By the cold. So what does it mean in a word? What that, does it mean that, that, ice you, could that be you have concluded scientifically there there has there was, not anymore, right? There's only Oh know, it's there. Oh the, well the, the, the signs that water as we know it, water, H two O water did at one point exist on the moon. What does this mean in the larger sense? Since we're looking larger you, today. You know and probably never existed was actually water. It's H2O, and it ends up in the form in minerals, or it ends up in the in um, ices. So it's solid H2O, okay. but you never, probably never you had you liquid never go water. Never swimming, never drink no. that but stuff. But that ice no. uh, could be used as rocket fuel someday. We <laughs> when we uh. go to the moon and we stay, it could be a resource for us. Ah, and and that opens the whole question of how many other things on the moon could, could be, be resources, resources. Right. Yeah. it's all yeah. it's all it, it's fantastic possibilities isn't it oh it's fabulous yes, you know, let your mind fly every day and it may be you. it may be the thing that opens up the whole solar system for exploration because you have this big gas station nearby that's why we've decided to do this show research in Manoa with you guys Jeff Taylor and Linda Martell for the next nine billion years. Oh, yes. Because we know there's <laughs> enough material out there to keep us busy, right? <laughs>